Welcome to the Gospel of Matthew, the gospel, the good news of the arrival and the death of the king on our behalf. Now, Matthew records a gospel, and so does Mark and Luke and John. There are four of them. Now, have you ever stopped to ask why? Why do we have four gospels all telling the same story? Well, they are pretty similar, but they're not the same. Um, you see, these authors are working with the same historical events and probably a common source, but each one has a unique emphasis or purpose that they're attempting to highlight in the life of the king. Therefore, Mark was rewritten by Matthew and Luke to meet the specific needs of their spiritual community, including certain stories, excluding other stories, kind of tweaking the wording of accounts here and there, rearranging and reordering events, all to best communicate a particular facet of the story of the king for their specific audience. Now, the audience of Mark, uh, we think, was probably Christians in Rome. Of course, we know the, um, Luke wrote to the most excellent Theophilus, a educated and a cultured Gentile. John was probably writing to those more influenced by Greek thought. But Matthew, our buddy Matthew, has been called the most Jewish gospel. Yes, Matthew is writing to Jewish believers, but he also probably had an evangelistic purpose as well, attempting to convince unbelieving Jews that Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, is Israel's Messiah, Israel's king, the son of David. He's Israel's king, but he was rejected by the nation of Israel. Now, Matthew, He's going to tell this story in a very orderly and systematic way, structured around five teachings. Now, we're all probably familiar with the first teaching, the first sermon of uh, Jesus's here in the book of Matthew. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, let's take a look at how the Sermon on the Mount ends. Look how Matthew concludes that great sermon of Jesus's. So it's in chapters five through seven. You get to the end of chapter seven and look what it says. I've highlighted it in green. When Jesus finished these sayings, crowd were astonished at his teaching. Um, no one ever taught like this. Wow, that was a really fantastic sermon. Let's jump now to Jesus's second sermon. This is when he calls and commissions the 12 uh, disciples to go preach throughout Israel. And look at the end. Right after the sermon, at the end of chapter 10, it says when Jesus had finished instructing the 12, he went on from there. Well, that kind of reminds me a little bit of this phrase here at the end of chapter 7 when Jesus finished these sayings. Okay, curious, curious. Um, let's jump now to Jesus's third sermon. This is uh, chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom. And at the end of these parables, what does it say? But when Jesus finished these parables, he went on from there. Okay, let's look at his teaching for the church. Um, his fourth uh, sermon, this is in chapter 18. And let's see, at the end of chapter 18, oh, look at this. When Jesus finished these sayings, he went on from there. Well, it seems to me that our our good buddy Matthew is leaving us breadcrumbs, isn't he? He's He's deliberately arranged his gospel uh, around these five teachings, and he's left this little concluding line at the end of each of these sermons, uh, signaling us how he wants us to break up his work into uh, different pieces. Take a look at this, this chart. So not only has Matthew uh, arranged his work and uh, signaled the conclusion of each of these five sermons with a phrase uh, similar to when Jesus finished these sayings, when he finished instructing the 12, finished these parables, these sayings, these sayings. Um, these sermons begin, um, three of them at least, with a statement of Jesus sitting down. When he saw the crowds, he sat down and began his, his teaching here in chapter Five. Um, when the crowds gathered him, he got into a boat. And what did he do? He sat down. Um, chapter 24, he went up to the Mount of Olives and uh, sat down and began teaching. Very much different than the way that we 
uh, preach, um, we stand up and we preach and we teach and everyone who listens to us sits down. But it was the opposite in Jesus's day. Now, three uh, of these discourses as well begin with the phrase of either the disciples coming to Jesus or crowds coming to him. And then three others are going to conclude with the statement of Jesus finished, and then he went on from there. He went on from there. He went away from Galilee. Now, all of these um, these statements, these, these formulas that are used by Matthew are acting as dividing lines um, within his gospel. It's a long book, 28 chapters. And having been given these dividing lines, it is possible for us to divide the gospel into blocks before and after each of these, these five discourses, these five sermons. And this is great news for someone who's trying to figure out the book of Matthew. It invites us now to examine each block um, as an independent unit and try to determine the purpose of that unit. So here are the five blocks as I see them in the book of Matthew. Um, in purple here are the discourse sections, the sermons, but then um, each block is composed of a narrative introduction. There's a narrative and a discourse, a narrative and a discourse. And we see that here on the board, We've got a narrative here uh, highlighted in orange and the discourse in green. Um, and that's how we're going to study the book of Matthew together. One block at a time. Um, but before we get to Matthew's first block of narrative and discourse, he is going to open his gospel with a two-chapter prologue. And that is what we're going to turn to next.